have uh, understood I'm an historian and um, I will um, reflect on the history of European integration uh, from the start, so from, from, from Yalta in, in 1945 to the war in Ukraine, but basically I choose the Yalta because it was in the same um, area as, as Ukraine, uh, uh, obviously, but uh, um, the point is to reflect on the current state of the EU uh, with an historical lens uh, starting from 19. 45 and, and even a little bit uh, before um, you will see. So the, um, the talk is based on, on this book um, uh, released in French, uh, Europe contre Europe, uh, entre liberté, solidarité et puissance, which can be translated by Europe against Europe between liberty, solidarity and power. So I, I checked with uh, uh, an, uh, an Englishman over, over lunch, uh, Europe puissance can be uh, rightly translated by um, uh, Europe as a power or Europe as a great power, depending on, on what you, you mean uh, by, by it. So it's not uh, uh, Brussels globish, it's, it's uh, uh, genuine English. Um, and um, so I will present the book. Uh, so the book deals with European integration history from 1945 to 2021. And I will add uh, a couple of reflections on 2022 on the war in Ukraine. Uh, at the end of uh, the presentation when, when I will deal with uh, Europe as a power. So I will uh, just um, uh, present, explain why I, I choose to, to wrote uh, the book, how I did it, um, and then uh, what are the, the main results, namely the three um, um, types of European uh, cooperation that I have uh, um, uh, identified and the, the, the debate between, between them that um, uh, have uh, developed, evolved over, over the years. So uh, the Europe as a market, a liberty, Europe as a, a space of solidarity, dealing with social and environmental policy, and Europe as a power. Before uh, concluding, so I, I'm, I will try not to be too long. The, uh, please not read all the, the slides because uh, each time I make a presentation, I have interesting questions and background from, from the colleagues, uh, the students uh, and, uh, and the attendees in general, So which, which leads me to add further uh, information in the PowerPoint presentation. But uh, I, I won't uh, deal with all, uh, all points, but I, I can come back to, to them during the Q&A session if you uh, wish to. So why did I um, uh, work uh, on, on this issue? So the aim for me was uh, as an historian to make sense of the history of the EU. So I could uh, stop there because for an historian it's, it's enough. Uh, but let's say that I wanted to understand why uh, the EU, despite um, um, many crises, was uh, able to, re to reinvent itself. And also why uh, did the EU prevail over other form of um, international cooperation? and even other form of, uh, of uh, socio-economic policy. Uh, why do we have the EU and not uh, only the, the UN or, or the WTO, or just only uh, national policies in many areas? Um, this is a, a question worth uh, considering because as an historian, um, you, you discover that um, the, the choice of European cooperation was not uh, a given, was not a mechanical. There were many uh, various um, um, alternatives available. So at some point, it's important to understand why, uh, in the end, did the EU prevailed in some areas and not others, and how to explain its peculiar mix of uh, policy. Um, so this is the big question, and also I wanted to address what uh, uh, Nicolas mentioned, namely the, the gap uh, between history on the one hand. In history, we are um, uh, dealing with uh, um, events that are more than 30 years old usually, and the current uh, debates, uh, the, the work in, in, in sociology, political science, uh, law, um, economy, uh, especially since um, um, if you study the history of, of, the, of European integration, there are, there are many scholars who are not historians as such in history department. There are many uh, 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 socio, uh, 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 um, um, I don't know, I mean, uh, uh, like Antoine Vaucher, so people who are, who are between uh, political science and sociology uh, who, are, who are very uh, active. So I think uh, at some point, um, the, the um, the, um, uh, the division between academic discipline was a little bit artificial. So how uh, did I uh, manage uh, to um, um, research this topic, the history of the EU? So I chose uh, an historical approach based on the history of public policy. So I tried to um, understand, to decipher why did 
uh, leaders uh, uh, take some decision and what were the, the different choices available. Um, that's why I use archives. I or I used uh, works that use archives uh, whenever uh, possible, uh, because in archives you have uh, more documents that reveal not hidden secrets, but uh, that uh, um, provide more information about the motivations of uh, actors. Um, so it's useful to go beyond the official discourse. Uh, it's not always true. Sometimes everything is in uh, in, in a newspaper account in uh, in in the great literature. But um, uh, most of the time, you 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 find uh, uh, interesting uh, stuff in uh, archive, especially to uncover alternative paths, alternatives that, that were not uh, taken. So as uh, Nicola underline, I try to have a, a sheer uh, European, a genuine European viewpoint in my uh, study. Uh, so of course it's impossible to study the, the 27 28 uh, um, eu member states uh, but uh, at least i had a, a look at the archives of the, of the three uh, biggest uh, player france britain and germany and uh, of the european commission so these are the four actors that are, are, are followed mostly for for most issues for most years and then uh, depending on the issue i added other archives, archives of uh, other international organizations, IO means international organizations, um, in order to understand why at some point the, the EU or the EEC in the past was chosen and not the UN or ILO, the ILO is the International Labour Organization or the OECD. And, uh, some, and also for some um, issues, I also had a look at the archives of uh, um, trade unions to the ETUC or of business actors. So, but just for 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 a couple of issues because um, I, uh, as you are beginning to understand, I studied many uh, different events, many different policies over the years, and it's it's impossible to to have these uh, complete um, uh, cubist vision on all uh, on all issues. So basically, I, I use archives in eight countries for my own research and a vast uh, body of literature. Uh, so the book builds on uh, what I found on the period ranging from 1973 to 1986, which was published in English. And then I expanded uh, the arguments on the, the, the whole history of European integration. Um, so the main result is um, the the, the the fact that you can uh, roughly speaking divide the history of Europe uh, or consider interpret the history of European integration as a contest between three forms of Europe. So when I wrote the book, I had the choice uh, between writing a chronological history of Europe and well, this has already been done uh, many times uh, quite successfully. So uh, I, I didn't see the, the point. Um, at some point, I, w I wanted to write a history of pub of policies. So let's say uh, a trade policy, uh, internal trade policy, external trade policy, competition policy, uh, social policy. Uh, and so on and so forth. But then um, I discovered that there were so many interlinkages and also um, that within each public policy, there were so many different uh, political projects that I needed uh, another, um, um, another tool to, to interpret uh, those debates. So that's why I, I came, up, I came uh, across with the, um, the, the three um, uh, the debate between the three types of European cooperation, liberty, uh, solidarity and power. So the, the first two are, are quite obvious. If you read um, Amandine's book on, on social Europe, so you, you will see very clearly the opposition uh, between, uh, let's say, a free market or neo or liberal or neoliberal Europe and a social Europe, which um, uh, attempt to, to correct the imbalances created by, by the market. So the first two categories are, are quite obvious. So uh, if you believe if you if you believe in, in market, you you believe that's uh, to uh, create growth, to create prosperity. Uh, the best way to cooperate among Europeans is to uh, create a big market, uh, and uh, this uh, uh, what uh, has been the dominant form of, of European cooperation, European integration. Um, um, even though there were there were division between the, the, the different types of uh, market-oriented integration, but I argue and that of course European integration has been driven mainly by market-oriented uh, forces, by a market-oriented thrust, uh, by the the attempt to build a regulated market. 
And then um, you had other actors uh, that wanted to, to complete European integration by a quest for um, uh, a more social or environmental Europe in order to uh, compensate for the, um, the imbalances created by market forces, so what the, the economists call uh, negative externalities, such as inequalities, uh, pollution, uh, and so on and so forth. So I put environmental policy in this category. But then if you study the archives, especially of uh, companies, um, you discover that um, most companies uh, do not want free market. What they want is protection. I mean, because the best way to, to uh, maximize your benefit is to have a monopoly somewhere. So uh, the, the best way to have a monopoly, uh, the legal way to have a monopoly is to, to have an innovation. So Google builds the, the best uh, 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 search engine, so it, it has a sort of a monopoly acquired more legally. I mean, there, there are debates within the antitrust community about that, but at, at least Google acquired a monopoly through innovation. But in the past, many companies um, um, increased their benefits uh, because they, they got privileges, monopolies by the state in the form of um, um, uh, uh, protectionism or state aid. Um, and so if you, if, you, if you have this in mind, uh, you, it doesn't fit into the, in the category pro or, or against the market. It's a third category. You need to invent a third category. And it's a category which is called by the specialist of international political economy, neo-mercantilism. Uh, mercantilism, it was a kind of policy practiced in the 17th, 18th century by many European countries, um, which can be called, I mean, it's an anachronistic, anachronistic term, uh, but it can be summarized as, as an active industrial policy. So basically stated, states wanted to uh, uh, boost up their infant industry by protectionism, by state aid, or sometimes by creating some companies somewhere successful. For example, the, the French uh, giant uh, glassmaker Saint-Gobain was created by Colbert, the, the French minister of uh, Louis XIV at the end of the 17th century. So um, the, um, the practice uh, has been quite successful in, in some cases. And um, it, it is, I mean, the idea is still influential now. So nobody is mercantilist anymore because we live in an area of, to some extent, free trade. So that's why we we, uh, we call this approach neo-mercantilism uh, today. It means that you respect the, the rules of free trade, broadly speaking, except if you are Donald Trump. Um, um, but you still manage to, to, to help your companies through state aid, through um, um, uh, protectionism or disguise protectionism. So it's, it's the kind of approach which is quite uh, widespread uh, all, all over Europe, but which is uh, almost never acknowledged. So no, nobody call, call himself or herself a neo-mercantilist, whereas uh, many people claim that they are defender of free market or defender of a more social uh, Europe or a social perspective or a more environmental friendly perspective. Um, if you look, for example, uh, today um, uh, at the, the massive German plan uh, to help uh, the German economy, uh, it has uh, created a lot of anxiety uh, all over Europe about the amount of uh, state aid that Germany would hand over to its company. But Germany will never recognize that, that it is neo-mercantilist because neo-mercantilist is, is it's, it's a sort of dirty word. It means protectionist and it smells its, its max of, uh, of uh, socialism to, to some extent. Um, so this is the third, the third way, neo-mercantilism, which I conflate in a broader category called power. Because um, in France, you know, uh, many presidents, the current one, but even past presidents have talked a lot about Europe puissance, uh, creating, um, um, shape Europe as a, as, a, as a power, as a global power. And this fits into this perspective. Namely, that's uh, the, the main aim in, 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 this, in this approach is not to um, um, spread the market dynamic, as in the first one, or to correct it, uh, to to um, uh, protect the weakest. The aim in this approach, in, the, in this uh, neo-mercantilist or in this power approach, in this power politics approach, is to uh, foster your own community. So you, 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 the, the, the French companies or the French people, if you are French, or European companies or European people, if you if you have a sort of European uh, patriotism. So that's why those three categories they are they they. Um, are um, um, 
uh, useful to describe uh, social economic policy, and the book is mainly about social economic policy, but you can extend uh, the, um, the, uh, the typology to talk about international politics. So the first one, liberty, those are the ones who believe that free trade uh, will uh, spread um, uh, political freedom, so the linkage between political liberalism and economic liberalism, what, will, what was called at some point Wilsonism, but then I discovered in Princeton two weeks ago or three weeks ago that Wilson is, is not uh, um, a politically correct person anymore. So uh, let's say it's uh, international liberalism. Um, so you believe uh, basically that uh, spreading political and economic liberty will, will create uh, peace and growth. In the second step, of course, it's um, uh, it, it reminds uh, uh, people of international socialism. You believe that if you build a fairer world with uh, redistribution uh, with um, um, uh, tools to alleviate the, the detrimental consequences of capitalism, the world would be, would be better for everybody. And in the, in the third step, well, it's basically power politics. So it, it's the zero sum game. So uh, if you um, if you uh, want to uh, empower your community, you must do it at the expense of other. But uh, I mean, the, the third category is not negative in, in the sense that everybody tends to practice industrial policy or to protect its own uh, community, uh, but you can do it in a more or less aggressive way. Uh, for example, protecting uh, the, um, uh, the appellation of champagne in order to avoid that everybody in the world uh, who is doing spark sparkling wine can call it champagne. It's neo-mercantilism, but it's not, you know, uh, extremely aggressive, extremely nationalist. Um, increasing uh, custom duties unilaterally and massively, as uh, Donald Trump did, uh, was a kind of a more assertive and radical uh, neo-mercantilism. So again, you have those three categories, if, and for each of them, you have quite the, the I mean, the, the moderate and the radical version. So for the market-oriented, those would be the neoliberal. Uh, the social, it will be, uh, let's say, the Marxist socialist or the, uh, the uh, alter uh, uh, um, uh, uh, globalization. And for neo mercantilists it would be uh, the autarchic policies of uh, um, um, authoritarian regime in, in the 1930s. And then, of course, the, the policies that I will describe are often a mix of all those three um, uh, approaches. So that's that's why there are ideal tips uh, in the in the Weberian sense. They are, they are never um, encountered in nature, but they are useful to um, 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 recognize uh, what is happening. But I can come back here later. So basically, uh, the golden age, so what we can call Keynesian policy, it was a mixture of social neo-mercantilist policies with a few. Uh, uh, with some uh, um, some some free trade, also international free trade, but uh, at a very uh, at a rather low level in the 50s, 60s, the world was still quite protectionist, even though there was a commitment to to uh, um, uh, increase uh, uh, free trade. So it was a mixture between social and uh, and, the, the, and the between the social and the neo mercantilist perspective. And then we can talk more and more um, about that. But I will probably um, no. I think it's time to. To give a little bit of a concrete example, um, how I envisage this um, this uh, trilogy. So here it's um, it's a, a table I put uh, to answer questions about the link between economic policies and institutions. So I can talk about that later if you want. Obviously, if you want to build a market-oriented Europe, you need lighter institutions than if you want to build um, an ambitious uh, social, environmental, and power Europe. So that's uh, basically the idea. But the book is mainly about uh, social. I mean, the, um, in my uh, in my understanding, the value added of the book uh, lies more in the in the um, uh, in socio-economic than rather than its in its um, institutional perspective. So anyway, um, so the content of the book. Um, so as Nicolas said, it's uh, the, the the framework is is thematic. So um, I, I have a first part on let's say the concepts. But then um, I made two chronological parts, one on the Cold War from 1945-48 to 1992, and then on the last years, uh, because um, while well, European integration have, have changed considerably after the Maastricht Treaty, so that's the scientific reason. And then there is also a methodological reason, namely that um, um, the, the work of historians uh, 
are um, uh, contained in part two and not in part three because we 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 must wait 30 years bef uh, uh, before the, the release of archives so that's why the part two is based on um, work by historians and other social scientists and part three is based um, on work by other scholars and my own contribution is more uh, in uh, part two than part three except a couple of uh, information on competition policy so um Market-oriented Europe, um, so it's quite uh, obvious that uh, European integration um, is or has been first and foremost uh, um, concerned with building an integrated market. So you had the common market at first in 57, even before you had the common market for, for steel and, and coal that uh, Nicolas studied. Uh, and then you had the single market in the or the internal market. Um, uh, program from 85 to 92 and then you had the uh, the um, uh, even a common currency with with the euro so that's already uh, well known and uh, i um, uh, document uh, this this history um what is probably a little bit um uh, original in the book is that i come back earlier than uh, the um, what is considered as the origin of the EU, namely the, the European Coal and Seed Community. You know that the Europe's Day on the 9th of May celebrates uh, the Schuman Declaration on the 9th of May 1950. Um, it is held at, at the, the starting point of European, of European, uh, European integration, whereas in fact it was more the starting point of the European communities, uh, of the, the European institutions as, as we know uh, them. But there were already other European organizations before, uh, in particular, the, the first one was the OEC, the um, Organization for um, European Economic Cooperation, uh, which was the organization set up in the framework of the Marshall Plan in, 19, in 1947. So in 1947, the US proposed the Marshall Plan, um, uh, but they, they um, uh, asked the European to build a European organization to, to distribute uh, the Marshall Plan fund and also to coordinate the reconstruction plan. So it didn't happen. Uh, and the OEC was considered as a, as a, as a, uh, um, a transitory short-term organization. But um, I mean, from a retrospective point of view, it, it is still the first organization of European cooperation. And the OEC is based on the idea of building Europe as a market. Uh, because the, the American handed over aid to Europe, uh, but they, they asked the Europeans, so first to open up their market to American product, which is uh, normal. I mean, in, um, in uh, most uh, operation of international help, there's always a trade-off. Uh, but the American also requested the Europeans to open up their market uh, to their European neighbors starting from a very low basis. I mean, the world was very, I mean, um, uh, you know, European, intra-European exchanges were very, very low. So the, um, the idea was there to create Europe uh, through the markets to uh, foster uh, peace and to promote growth. Um, and then the idea was taken over by the, the various uh, communities. And I mentioned 1990 because you can find this ID in a very famous book by Keynes, the, the, the um, uh, uh, British economist Keynes, uh, who, whose first book was The Economic Consequence of the Peace. The book is, is very well known for, it, for its critique of the reparation system. But actually, if you read the book toward the end, the book is freely available online. Um, you will see the solution that Keynes advocates. So Keynes advocate for uh, uh, less reparation, which is very well known and which has been used against France in the 1920s. Uh, but Keynes argues also for the setting up of uh, European, um, I don't remember his, his exact um, uh, expression, but uh, I think he used the word uh, European uh, free trade uh, zone or free trade area. Um, at least he, he wanted to have uh, lower custom barriers in France, uh, in, in Europe, sorry after 1919. Why? Because many new states have uh, been created after 1919, after the demise of the big uh, central empire, the German empire, the Austro-Hungarian empire, the Russian empire, the Ottoman empire. Many new, relatively small European states have been set up, Austria, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Poland, and this hampered trade. So uh, for Keynes, uh, an obvious solution to ease the reconstruction of Europe was to um, uh, uh, lower trade obstacles, uh, no reparation 
and uh, no inter-allied debt because uh, France and Britain wanted reparation from Germany because they had to pay their debt to the US. So Keynes advocated the, the cancellation of US debt and uh, US loan to Europe. So this is exactly what was uh, implemented after 1947, so US loan to Europe or US uh, even aid to Europe, uh, European market and uh, no or almost no reparation to Germany from Germany. So the idea was there in 1919, but it was implemented only in 1948 in um, a North Atlantic uh, framework before then being taken over by the Europeans for themselves. Um, so you get, I think, the, the big picture. So the book uh, documents um, not only the, let's say, the archaeology of this idea with skins, but also the, um, the main debate that has occurred um, within this uh, market-oriented Europe, namely between the setting up of an integrated market, uh, this is what was uh, done, and the setting up of a mere free trade area. Um, so this was a solution advocated by the British in the 50s, but also later on, uh, the, the idea comes back to the fore, and at the, at the end of the book, I uh, wonder if the free trade area cannot come back thanks to a Brexit, depending on the way um, of the, the, the future uh, UK-EU relationship is handled. Um, so depending uh, in particular of, of the, the Northern Irish uh, protocol. Um, so I can uh, delve a little bit more into the detail if you want uh, afterwards. So on, on European monetary integration, I find a, a couple of uh, points about um, uh, the, um, the failed attempt of a concerted stimulus that happened in 1978. You know that during the Eurozone crisis, there were a lot of talks, maybe you, uh, some of you are too young to remember that, but for, um, for, for some of us it's very, it's very vivid. During the Eurozone crisis, there were a lot of talk uh, from France, uh, but also from the IMF for Germany to um, reflate, so to, to uh, spend more money because it had a low debt and in order to um, uh, foster growth in Europe. And uh, there, there were many resistance by, by Germany, but actually they, the, it was the same story in 1978, and here uh, Germany agreed to uh, what was called a concerted stimulus, uh, which ended up in failure but because it was managed just before the second oil shock. And it created even a, a, a short-term uh, German uh, balance of payment crisis. So it's interesting because it, it has remained, uh, in my opinion, in, in the, the mind of uh, uh, West German negotiators when they negotiated the EMU in, in the 1980s. Well, then I can say more about competition policy, neoliberalism, and so on and so forth. But I think so. Uh, here you, you get the uh, the, the ID. Um, so European integration has been mainly about building uh, an integrated market, um, with the debate between do we want an integrated market or do we want a free trade area or uh, to some extent a neoliberal Europe, according to which uh, Europe is uh, concerned mainly by. Um, um, suppressing mar uh, market barriers and not building uh, more uh, protec protective uh, measures. Uh, so here I discussed also the influence of neoliberalism, ordo liberalism, especially under the, the Barroso uh, Commission. Facing this uh, market-oriented Europe, of course, we have uh, the, let's say, the social and environmental Europe. Um, so I coined, I, I used the term solidarity uh, to to um, um, talk about uh, do, those uh, various attempts. Uh, it's also a matter of uh, having a, a small a small words uh, which were which were understandable uh, as a subtitle. So again, here solidarity is a long-term pattern in European integration. If you think about the OEC, uh, the Marshall Plan was about solidarity because it, you have the richest country in the world, the USA. Um, delivering uh, aid to countries that were poorer in those days. So this is the very definition of solidarity. So of course you can argue that the Americans were not uh, uninterested, that they wanted to open up the American market, that they were con that they were motivated by the Cold War, uh, they wanted to sell their product. Obviously that's always the case when uh, France and I suspect when Belgium help uh, another country uh, um, with an international aid package, uh, it also expects um, um, advantages. Uh, 
Uh, but still, it is what we can define by solidarity. So then there have been discussions about the size of the Marshall Plan, but even uh, historians critical of the Marshall Plan, of the importance of the Marshall Plan, like Alan Millward, recognize that it was a significant contribution to the reconstruction of Europe. Um, but then solidarity um, was important at the, at the start of the ECSC. So here, Nicola uh, examined it, but then it, it vanished more or less. So in the ECSC, there were uh, trade unionists involved in the management of the ECSC, but the ECSC was more or less a, a semi uh, semi failure. So when the Treaty of Rome creating our current European Union was uh, signed in 1957, uh, the main aim was to build a regulated market and solidarity was really left to uh, very uh, secondary uh, legislation. Um, but it's logical also because in the 50s, it was uh, um, the time of the expansion of national welfare states. So for many um, leaders who build uh, Europe, the priority was to um, uh, use Europe uh, to um, um, alleviate the problem of international trade, um, to solve a possible conflict in international trade, uh, whereas social policies were dealt with at the international level. Uh, so it doesn't mean that there were no projects of social Europe. So here uh, I will uh, uh, let me underline the role played uh, by the German Chancellor Willy Brandt uh, in 1969-1970 when he launched uh, an ambitious project of social Europe and of Jacques Delors, the French president of the European Commission from 85 to 95. And here you can reconstruct um, the, the element of solidarity that are present in European integration, even if they are secondary compared to the first uh, dynamic, uh, which you can find in, um, in, in um, two main areas. First, in terms of legislation, legislation on gender equality, working condition, on environment. So I'm looking um, um, more into the, the detail of environmental legislation. And um, I can say that, at least from a French perspective, European laws in, in some areas were more protective than, than French laws. So it, it, uh, some European law represented an, an improvement, if you, if you believe, at least in, uh, in the necessity to preserve the environment. Um, so I have an example about uh, car emission, the negotiation about car emission in the 1980s. Uh, France was really against, uh, but uh, the, 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 the need to, to push for cleaner uh, cars uh, came from uh, Germany and Northern European countries and France in the end um, yielded. And then you have the, um, the other manifestation of, of solidarity in Europe is targeted redistribution through what is called now cohesion policy. So for a country like Belgium, probably it doesn't amount uh, too much because Belgium is a rich country. But if you are a poor country, cohesion policy represents a significant amount of GDP. Um, uh, so, and here, uh, the, the only time I, I mention Ukraine in the book is by comparing GDP per capita of Poland and Ukraine in 1989 or 1990. I think it was 1991 or 92, basically, because uh, I think you have to, to wait for the independence of Ukraine to have reliable statistics. But anyway, so um, let's say after the fall of the Soviet Union, GDP per capita was uh, more or less on a par between uh, Poland and Ukraine. I think Poland was 10 or, or 15 percent richer than Ukraine. And um, then uh, 25 years later, uh, Poland um, became three or four times richer as Ukraine, depending on the statistics you find. I'm talking about the situation of Ukraine before the, the war in Ukraine, of course. I think the statistics I used were from 2019. And why um, did uh, Poland uh, become so so rich? Because because of market uh, Europe, because it was integrated in a in a prosperous uh, market, so it could attract a lot of uh, foreign direct investment. But also because it received a lot of uh, fund through uh, cohesion policy. Um, and here, um, as I said, um, cooperating in terms of social policy. And in terms of environmental policy, as we saw with the COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh, is not easy. Uh, so that's why if you study social Europe and environmental Europe from a historical perspective, you will discover many failures. Uh, but I think uh, that some of those failures are interesting also to, to document if, um, if uh, you, you, 
you deal with uh, um, a project that were seriously discussed. So it was the, the case uh, for European planning. So uh, the, the attempt to build a European wide planning was discussed several times in the 60s and the 70s. Well, obviously not by uh, the, the top leaders, but the idea was mentioned several times at, at the European Commission. Um, so the notion of planning, we were discussing uh, this uh, with some ending the, uh, that the notion of, of, of planning is coming back into the, 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 the fit for 55 uh, project into, into the, the new uh, uh, green uh, policies, to some extent also into the, the strategic imperative to relocate some strategic industry in the EU. Uh, so this idea of planning have been um, uh, quite uh, uh, fashionable, let's say, in the 60s and 70s. In the 60s, you had even US uh, scholars that came in France to study French indicative planning. Um, so it means that uh, planning, which, which was discarded in the 1990s and early 2000s and as an old-fashioned approach uh, to economic management, um, has been, in fact, a quite flexible uh, a concept that have been uh, used uh, many times and uh, have led to many uh, different kind of proposals. I can come back on that if you want. Uh, Hugo uh, Kenyak, who is also present here, I've also studied the various projects of European pr planning devised in the in the in the 50s first and then 60s, 70s. Uh, then I will um, say a few words about uh, an interesting project to democratize a multinational called the, the Vredling Directive that was proposed in 1980, um, that I studied together also with Aurélie Andrine uh, and uh, Francesco uh, Petrini. It's an interesting project because it, it, it was a failure, uh, but it was a revealing uh, failure of what would have been possible to, to some extent and also of a shift toward a more neoliberal uh, area. So what was the Vredling Directive? So Vredling was um, a Dutch uh, commissioner who proposed a dire directive to democratize multinationals. So basically, it meant, to some extent, the extension of the co-determination system, the German co-determination system, so Mitbestimmung, to the European level. So to associate um, trade unionists or representatives of workers to the board in order to improve um, uh, working conditions and to, to, to avoid uh, unnecessary uh, layoff. Um, so the directive was a failure, mainly because it was proposed in 1980, and in 1980 it was already too late because uh, Thatcher was uh, in power uh, since 1979, and of course she she vetoed uh, all the directive. But what is interesting is where uh, did the, the directive uh, come from? It comes from a massive debate at the, the start of the 1970s on the necessity to democratize companies at the national and at the international level. So it was, let's say, a post-1968 attempt to, um, to, to, for many intellectuals, uh, they say, well, we democratize uh, politics, and now it's time to democratize also the economy by giving workers uh, a bigger say in companies. And there were many projects at the national level to, to improve um, the, the, worker, the, the power of workers in companies. Uh, so there were high, high, um, high level commission uh, gathered in France, in Great Britain in 75, in Germany too, um, but it was only in Germany that it led to a, a third law, a third co-determination law. Um, and at the same time, the trade unionists wanted to promote the same kind of regulation at an international level to control multinationals, because in the 1970s, it was really the start of um, 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 let's say, a, a general uh, worry about the role of multinationals. You know that, for example, U.S. multinationals played a role in um, the, the demise of Allende in, in, in Chile uh, in the 1970s, um, also in, in Coop uh, in, in uh, Central American countries. So Amer American multinationals and, and, let's say, in Western multinationals were really criticized in the 1970s by um, developing countries, but also by, uh, I mean, workers, trade unionists, and their representatives in the, in, the, in the North. And at first, those actors, um, those from the source, from the North, choose to regulate multinationals through international organizations, so through the UN, the United Nations, through the ILO, the International Labour Organization, through the, the OECD. And those organizations adopted in the mid-1970s 
um, um, code, a non-binding code, code de bonne conduite, so a code of good behavior, to uh, police uh, the way multinational worked. Uh, so those were non-binding regulations. Um, and a couple of years later, the trade unionists were very deeply disappointed because uh, time and again, the reports say the, the multinational were very happy well with the, those regulations. They said that they, they implemented the regulation perfectly well and they, that there were no, no problem. And at this point, and you can see this in the archives of the European Trade Union Confederation in Amsterdam, um, the European trade unions realized that um, the European Union, in those days it was a European Economic Community, was a peculiar type of international organization because it had a federal law, because it had a more constraining law. And so they began, they, they began to see the interest of um, waging a social um, uh, uh, dispute within the EEC, the EU framework. Because in the EEC, EU, you had uh, um, uh, constraining leg legislation. It was much more um, uh, efficient than code of good behavior. So that's why the trade unionist, and Redling was a trade unionist, a Dutch trade unionist, proposed this directive in 1980. But it was already too late. Uh, but nevertheless, it led to a fierce debate at the European Parliament. And here I also saw in uh, business archives, the archives of the British um, Confederation of Business Industry, uh, how the business community um, lobbied the member of the European Parliament um, legally by organizing session to, to explain to, to them uh, why they had to vote against the proposed directive uh, because it was detrimental for uh, those multinationals. So it was interesting to see how uh, business began to organize itself uh, against the attempt by trade unionists to uh, forge a kind of a social Europe. So there's nothing illegal uh, in it, but it, it was interesting. So, for example, the, the British uh, Confederation of, of uh, British Industry uh, high, um, organized a, a meeting with the British member of uh, the parliament, the conservative British member of, of the European Parliament, and the German experts on co-determination to explain what would be the detrimental effect of co-determination co over uh, European multinationals. So basically, it was a failure, but it's interesting to 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 see where um, did this failure uh, come from. Then I could talk about car emission, about the law, um, if you have a more uh, question. So I think you get the, the picture about what uh, social Europe or environmental Europe means. Now let's turn to Europe as a, as a power. Uh, so Europe as a power, it means both Europe as um, uh, an industrial power, so uh, is Europe uh, um, as, 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 an, as an organization able to, to wage an industrial policy, and also Europe as a power from, let's say, the di diplomatic, from the, from the military point of view. Um, so obviously it's not, uh, because um, uh, in this area, in terms of industrial policy, in terms of deep diplomacy, in terms of uh, uh, military equipment, uh, mo the, 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 those prerogatives are, are mostly confined to, to nation states. Uh, military cooperation failed with the failure of the European Defence Community in 1954. And uh, military cooperation it is... Uh, still important at the international level in Europe, but uh, it goes through NATO. So basically it's through NATO, and we see this very clearly in the war in, in Ukraine, it's, it's through NATO that a kind of uh, European military um, uh, action exists nowadays in the war in Ukraine and even before, if, if you study also military cooperation. So I, I just devoted a couple of pages uh, in the book. Um, uh, many uh, military cooperation were um, uh, organized within the NATO framework uh, and based on American military equipment. There were, of course, intra-European cooperation that were successful, uh, but then it remains to be seen whether they, uh, the, the Europeanization trend will uh, grow or if the military cooperation will still remain within the NATO uh, framework. Um, but then uh, if you Again, if you have a larger uh, focus, you can consider that many attempts of the European Union to organize world trade, to avoid um, um, uh, an unregulated liber uh, globalization, 
were also part of this uh, neo-mercantilist view of the world. Uh, so in the 1970s, there were many attempts, uh, but um, even in 2022, uh, if you, if you um, look at the carbon border adjustment mechanism, this is exactly uh, what uh, a neo-mercantilist policy is. So the carbon border adjustment mechanism, it's an, uh, in theory, uh, it everything rests on, on in its implementation, but in theory, it could be a tax levied on product uh, imported in Europe that do not um, um, respect the same high environmental standard as those produced in uh, within the EU. So, so it's a tool that could be, at least in the French perspective, in France it was called the carbon tax. Uh, it's it's a it's a tool that could be used in a neo-mercantilist way. So it's a moderate form of neo-mercantilism. And the uh, most obvious success of uh, European neo-mercantilism is uh, this Airbus. So Airbus, it's uh, really, it epitomizes uh, uh, to some extent European neo-mercantilism uh, because it's a successful industrial cooperation first, successful from the, from the commercial point of view. It's a strategic cooperation. So uh, states uh, delivered massive state aids to the companies taking part in Airbus uh, for decades. So Airbus was set up in 67 and it uh, uh, became to, to, to be um, um, to, to wield the large benefits only in the 1990s. So for decades, states massively funded Airbus for strategic purpose because um, so there was a, a, an economic element. And in the in the book, I mentioned a study by Paul Krugman, the American economist, who explained that the barrier to entry on the Ameri on the the, um, the uh, airplane market was so high that any new competitors had to be massively uh, uh, funded, so by state subsidies, uh, but also for strategic reasons. So for France, it was important to, to, to support the, the French aeronautic industry. And here I relied on the research made by Hal Farans, uh, a German historian, who showed that even in Germany, even if it was not acknowledged officially, uh, German officials also were very keen on supporting Airbus to uh, rebuild the uh, German uh, aeronautic industry after 1955, because be between 45 and 55, there were, uh, Germany did not have the right to produce um, aircraft. Um, so it's typically a neo-mercantilist venture because it rests on protectionism, on state aids, and, um, uh, and with a strategic uh, sector. So it, it was not a sector chosen at random. Um, it was a sector uh, which was uh, uh, massively supported because it could have also military and hence strategic implication. But the problem with Airbus, uh, so in France, um, I, and but I, 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 I gather also in other countries, uh, there were um, there have been many talks about uh, reproducing the success of, of Airbus in other sectors. The problem with Airbus is um, that it's difficult to reproduce uh, the, the Airbus sector, the, uh, the Airbus success. And you see on the picture why. Um, this is not a typical Airbus plane. This is uh, what is called the Beluga uh, Airbus. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, an airplane which was built to carry the different parts of Airbus between the different sites, between the different production sites, Be because Airbus is a venture developed by France, Germany, and Britain, and a little bit Spain, uh, which means that most Airbus are built across France, Britain, and Germany. And the parts are carried out by the, uh, those, uh, those, uh, those airplanes, the Beliga. So you can understand very well uh, why, from a functional point of view, from an industrial point of view, it's impossible to reproduce this kind of industrial venture and to, to build an aircraft among the 27 uh, member states, because each one of the member states will have its stake in the building of the aircraft. So you cannot have uh, one state building one wing, uh, another state building the other wing, or one wheel there, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. So for, from a functional point of view, is, uh, the, the example uh, of Airbus is hard to uh, reprodu reproduce. Um, and also from a financial point of view, because each state um, uh, needs to commit it, itself uh, from uh, on a long-term perspective, so needs to have a very, uh, what I call a, a very strong uh, neo-mercantilist uh, narrative. 
and which is not so uh, so uh, um, uh, easy to have in some countries. Um, and to conclude, Airbus was not an EU venture. It was not an EEC venture. It was not a company set up by European institutions. It was a company set up by European states. So it, it's a form of European cooperation, but outside the EU, even though there are interlinkages because the, the, it's the EU Commission that um, defend Airbus at the WTO. But Airbus is really an intergovernmental uh, venture. So you, you can see here very clearly why um, uh, what is European neo-mercantilism? So European neo-mercantilism, it's Airbus, it's to some extent the European Space Agency, it's, it's Galileo, but you can see also very clearly why it's difficult to uh, build uh, such companies. Also because if you are, uh, most EU countries are of course free trading nations and um, do this kind of venture also uh, triggers a trade conflict. Uh, there have been many trade conflicts with the US, the US between Airbus and Boeing. Uh, and this would be the same in, in every uh, kind of sector. So that's why it's difficult to build such a venture um, because there is always the risk of uh, a trade uh, retaliatory uh, measures. But anyway, it was um, it, it happened. So uh, this is basically what, what um, I'm saying here. So um, to finish uh, on uh, a note about European uh, neo-mercantilism or about Europe as a power, in the book I um, identify a return of the of the power politics, a return of of neo-mercantilism in Europe, but also in the world since 2016. Not so much because of Brexit, but because many of Donald Trump who had a very um, uh, open uh, neo-mercantilist discourse and also with the evolution of uh, probably the Chinese policies. The Chinese policy has always been neo-mercantilist, but probably even more under Xi Jinping than uh, before. Uh, so there is a return of neo-mercantilism at, at the world level, um, which has forced the EU to adopt a slightly more neo-mercantilist uh, trade policy. So even Germany has adopted a, a more uh, a vigorous uh, vocabulary dealing with industrial policy. For example, Germany supported the, the merger between Alstom and, and Siemens and criticized the European Commission for not having allowed uh, this merger, whereas in the past, uh, the German authorities never dared to, to criticize um, uh, the European competition policy. Uh, and then the new, the new um, uh, challenge in the war in Ukraine, um, Will the war in Ukraine reinforce Europe as a power, as a diplomatic power, as a military power on its own, or will it uh, simply uh, reinforce the, the Atlantic dimension of uh, uh, foreign and military cooperation? And to some extent also, uh, will the war in Ukraine tr trigger new internal tensions if there is a, a, so a massive socioeconomic crisis and if there is also a race a subsidy race. Uh, so that's the, the worry triggered in particular by the, the German uh, um, massive uh, stimulus plan. Uh, but it, I mean, uh, many countries have, have, uh, have uh, released uh, such plan. And this, um, this worry has always has already been uh, aired during the COVID-19 crisis. Some observers uh, compared the stimulus uh, package uh, uh, handed over during the, the COVID-19 crisis and also expected some problems in terms of, uh, let's say, living playing field. So uh, this is basically, I don't have any, any, any response about that, but these are the, the challenges uh, ahead. Um, so to conclude, uh, basically I would say, uh, just to remind you of the big picture that Europe as a market has been the dominant form of European cooperation, Europe as a regulated market. Uh, with debate between the, the Europe as a free trade area, as a neoliberal space or as a regulated space. Solidarity has been confined mainly uh, to a flanking policy and uh, power politics. So Europe as a power or Europe um, in a world of, of uh, a more uh, radical power politics um, um, has, been, uh, has been rising since, since uh, 2016. And I have a last slides on, on the new challenges ahead because I always get the, the, the questions. So, I, um, so the main challenges, according to me, are to, to deepen the internal market without neoliberalism, to accommodate neo-mercantilist tendencies, because the EU, even if there have been no EU neo-mercantilism, um, the EU, the EEC EU have been useful to 
um, uh, diffuse neo mercantilist uh, tendency and uh, neo mercantilist conflict so to 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 alleviate national protectionist tendencies within um, uh, um, uh, EU states. And then the third challenge will be to promote environmental policies in a neo mercantilist uh, world. So these those are just uh, those are not part of the research. But since since I always get the question about uh, what are the new challenges ahead, I thought that I could as well um, insert my answers in uh, in a slide. So I'm open to uh, to your uh, remark, uh, critiques, uh, suggestions, uh, and questions to help uh, uh, explain and uh, and uh, hopefully uh, further strengthen the the argument. Thank you very much for your attention.